Christianity has quickly found its way into society as a deciding factor for a vast majority of political decisions. But the problem is that it's not the only religion that matters. Evangelical Christianity has come to the forefront of so many political campaigns, political stances, and political talking points that it truly makes you wonder what happened to separation of church and state. Additionally, the evangelical community has been known for the idolatry of political figures and causing trauma for those who question their connection to politics. My guest today, Brent Hodge, has firsthand experience of being a part of the evangelical community and witnessing how politics made its way into the pulpit. His 25-year experience of being in full-time ministry created ups and downs that eventually led him to do the work of Jesus, but separate from the church. This is We Need to Talk Faith and Politics, part two. Brent Hodge, thank you so much for being on the show today. Oh, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. You know, you come from an extensive ministry background and your experience within the church, as I was reading, has been one of so many ups and downs and roller coasters. And there's a lot of church hurt and pain there. And I know you've seen it all, heard it all in your church experience, I'm sure, which probably makes you very understanding of kind of the societal view of religion and church as a whole. And having grown up in the church myself, I and, and have made my way through a myriad of church environments. I would say that I've seen it all and heard it all as well. But throughout your 25 years in full-time ministry, how have you seen politics find its way into the church and more specifically into the pulpit? Uh, well, you're just going to start off big, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I look back as far as I can remember back in junior high, my parents and my dad was a pastor uh, speaking about politics and being very much always on the conservative end and always painting a picture of the other side or bad people. And I saw that in church my entire life. The It wasn't until we moved back to Los Angeles uh, five years ago that we started to find people within the church that had similar viewpoints as ours, which was politics has divided the church internally. And you either go to a conservative church or you go to a liberal church. And if you're a person that talks about politics, you probably have a strong stance on abortion and on LGBTQ. And that will either be something you completely ignore and never talk about in your church and your people don't understand it and don't come together and don't have conversations and don't learn to be unified around differing thoughts and opinions. Uh, or you stand on either side of it and you're verbally strong uh, making statements from the pulpit, from the stage, whatever. So I literally have seen politics in every aspect of my life in every church I've been in. Uh, until the one I'm at now, which is a lovely small community that is led by a guy that uh, strong integrity, strong moral stance, but very loving and inclusive to everybody in the world because mm -hmm. everybody deserves a chance to get to know Jesus, no matter what we think about who's president, because it's irrelevant to our faith. So, yeah, I've seen it. <laughs> it, it, yeah. it is horribly divisive right now. Yeah, absolutely. And I think in, in just kind of capitalizing on one thing that you said, it's like it is a one or the other thing, which is so frustrating. It's like you either go to this type of church, or you go to this type of church. There hasn't been much come together, specifically when it comes to social justice aspects and activism and things like that. So when it comes to social justice and activism, what was your experience like in terms of the conversations? And I'd love for you to go just a little deeper into this in terms of the conversations that you would hear in regards to those things, because I've noticed for the concern conservative friends that I've had in the conservative circles that I've been around, those are like dirty words, <laughs> you know, though you don't want to hear social justice. You don't want to hear activism. You definitely don't want to hear about the LGBTQ community rights. You don't want to hear about Black Lives Matter. So from your experience, what were your conversations like surrounding those? I think exactly what you're saying. If I speak to a predominantly white, affluent and not even affluent, but a conservative person, if I say Black Lives Matter, they're going to tell me I'm aligned with an organization that hates people. Um, and I'm like, okay, can we step away from 
the misinformation and what you think an organization is to acknowledge that there are issues with race and discrimination and bias. And um, most of the time I can't have a conversation with someone who just adamantly has a wall, but I can have some great conversations with people that are just caught in the rhetoric, but don't really have a stance on it. Mm. Most of us in the Christian world might just take on the rhetoric or the things that are being said around us, or this group believes this, so I believe it with them, but we really don't dig in and get to know what it means for a black man or woman in our country to be oppressed. Um, they don't really have a buy-in on it. And so you can have conversations with them. You can start to help them understand and you can point them to a black brother or sister and have them sit down and listen to their side. But when it comes to talking about social justice, Black Lives Matter, don't even get me started on CRT and this whole <laughs> world of things. When it comes to that, when it comes to that, if a person is entrenched in a belief that there is a political stance and a, that that also means we've painted a picture on groups of people or groups of people that take stances against social misconduct. If you are aligned with that, you're not changing that person's mind. Like yeah. it's just, it's, it's endless conversation and rhetoric and you just not, it, it falls into all the political stuff. COVID, I mean, everything, you can't have a conversation about anything, but it's horrifying that we can't have conversations about social injustice. Yeah. Horrifying, yeah. especially in the church. Yeah, it is because, I mean, I was one of the people that was actually lucky enough to grow up in a pretty liberal church. So when I went off to college, and I've talked about this on the show before, when I went off to college, I went to a more conservative evangelical school and I was, it was a culture shock for me um, because I wasn't raised that way. And I didn't understand because my understanding of Jesus was very, very different from what their understanding of Jesus was. So for you in the churches that you've been in, because, you know, in reading about you, you you've been through quite a few churches, you know, and, and I think we all kind of have in our experiences. When did you kind of start to realize something wasn't quite right with the way churches were functioning? Yeah. So in 1997, um, I went into full-time ministry in 96, 97, uh, a pastor friend of mine and I kind of planted a church and was able to go full-time with them about a year and a half after we got planted. And we were there for 13 years and it was a thriving ministry in a heavily conservative, heavily white, heavily rural suburban area of Southern Oregon. And so we were entrenched in a lot of things. We didn't talk about race or politics would come up a little bit, even from stage, but it was mostly just jab here and there, but it was because we we're all white and we all thought the same thing. So we, we didn't have anything pushing against our comfort zone. About eight years into that ministry, we started to realize, my wife and I, that we, we don't fit here. And why don't we fit here? Is it because we did most of our growing up in LA, so it's dense and more urban, or and we're now in a small town, or mm -hmm. is it because the thought process and the, the, the political values? And we, so we really kind of dug into that, and we found that we did not belong there because the Jesus that we've been taught about all along, even in that church, all through my life, was starting to be represented in a way that was confusing to me. Hmm. The conservative were getting more conservative and it was turning more people away. And we were getting away from this. Uh, you don't even have to be an inclusive church for LGBTQ, but be inclusive for a person that is uh, aligns with that community. Like they're as welcome in this church as you are. Mm -hmm. And you need to have the conversations with them. And what you're doing is turning them away because we're becoming more like guarded and tough and conservative. And so we saw it shifting that way. And unfortunately, we then moved to a ministry that was a lot more polished and a lot bigger and a lot fancier and a lot more liberal because we were able to wear jeans and we had cool hair and we did cool music. That was what being liberal at that church was. Um, but we moved to that area and we even experienced it worse. I mean, it was wow. all disguised under a cover of fancy and polished and spectacular and entertainment. But um, I remember we had a conversation with a guy. He was uh, a 
a, a gay man at the church. He'd been there for years. One of the main statements of the church was everyone's welcome. We never once from stage talked about LGBTQ or racial things because the pastor felt that that was a private conversation that should be had between individuals. And there should never be a conversation as a whole, as a church, which just, I don't, that confuses me. Um, but this man one night, they were doing a new members class, like dinner, sit around tables, and each table had a host from the church that would kind of help people through if they had questions and get to know people. Well, one of the hosts got sick. And this guy who was helping coordinate the food and the event said to the pastor, I can step in. And the pastor immediately red flag, well, he's gay. Can he do that? Mm. And he actually called his boss and the boss said, no, he cannot lead. We, we, we put the line to gay men and women on being leadership. And that was considered a leadership role because he was going to represent the church that night in talking to them about the church. He'd been at the church for years. So the pastor had to call his wife to come down to the table and then tell that guy, actually, I can't have you lead tonight. Let's talk about it later. Well, that guy left the church. Um, He literally, because of, and and this was a guy that wasn't dating. He was celibate. Um, He loved the Lord. He was a volunteer for years, kicked out of that table wanting other people to be a part of his church because his church didn't want him to be a part of the church in certain ways. Um, So I've just seen it at every level. And when we got to that place, we realized we're not a part of anything that represents the Jesus we know. We're not a part of anything. Jesus didn't sit around with religious leaders. He bashed them because they were mocking what Jesus came to restore and bring back to life and to start in a new way because they weren't doing it well. Um, He sat down with the gay men and women. He sat down with the prostitutes and with the worst of the worst, the tax collectors. Um, That's who needed Jesus' love. And we're turning them away constantly in the church. And the more we saw that in every ministry we were a part of that we had no control over, the more and more we realized we do not fit in this church world and specifically the evangelical world anymore and the ministry we want to do i don't know if we can ever do in a church so i don't know if we'll ever be in a church doing ministry again Mm. well honestly i think the most powerful ministry does happen outside of the doors of the church if i'm gonna be honest yeah so you probably don't even need to step inside a church anymore to make a difference and do what jesus did because that's what Jesus did. He was out on the streets. He was on the field, you know, with people. So I don't think you need to go back at all. But I do want to ask a, a follow-up question because what I find so interesting in terms of hypocrisy, when you're talking about this man that left the church and he wasn't allowed to lead, I've noticed that that is always like a non-negotiable situation for churches. Cause I had that experience at a church that I served at in New York. When I was a worship leader there, they kicked a member of the worship team off because he was in a relationship with another man. And that was enough for me too. I, I, after that, I didn't even go back to a church for a couple of years, but there always seems to be excuses and grace for other situations. For example, um, infidelity, you know, things like that, uh, child pornography, molestation, et cetera, et cetera. So why do you think that is? Why is there such a level of grace and excuse and kind of sweeping under the rug for those, that type of behavior, but not the acceptance of someone that that's how God made them? Uh, Politics, (laughs) the church in the church in America has become nationalized at the core of who we are in the evangelical and conservative world is we love God and country and our country and the conservatives that we put on pedestals, same pedestals as our pastors uh, right next to Jesus. We say that being gay is wrong and they shouldn't have rights because it teaches about a man and a woman in the Bible and having an abortion is wrong because it's killing babies. And you can go down the list of things that are the stances. And now we know we have we have written and verbal proof that people like focus on the family and others in the eighties and nineties were distorting using things like abortion and gay rights to build conservative political cores Mm. and to get that into the churches. And so our churches had right to life days and, and all this stuff. And it's just a joke. We, we 50% of women inside and outside the church have experienced abortion. That's a statistic. 
it doesn't get less when it's inside the church. Right. In some regions, it gets worse when it's inside right, the church. Right. One out of every two women has experienced abortion. You're going to have a right to life Sunday at your church on a Sunday morning, whether you agree with abortion or not. That's not my, I, we're not talking about that. We've made it political because you're going to have a right to life rally at your church that Sunday morning. And a woman that's had an abortion and has guilt and shame about that is going to be terrified to be in that place that day because she knows she killed her baby because that's what she's going to hear from stage mm. all day long. And you're going to see pictures of dead fetuses and you're going to see kids that weren't aborted and you're going to see all these things that morning. And that poor woman is going to be devastated. And if her boyfriend or husband is with her that went through that decision as well, look, abortion doesn't affect one person. It affects two all the time, men yeah. and women. Men need to be cared for in that process too. Um, politics. It's absolutely politics. It, money, power, we're right, us, them. We have a nationalistic core church in America that absolutely is off the rails. And if we can't change it because it sounds like they're digging their feet in, then we're going to just leave it. You know, when it comes to one, let me back up by saying this. I always found it interesting growing up, though, that sometimes when I would go to different churches with my friends, because I grew up in an AME church, but even at my church, politicians would come and speak to the church congregations. And to me, it didn't ever really register until I got older, right? But mm -hmm. I found it so interesting as I've gotten older and understood how a lot of churches function and how a lot of politicians function, that there seems to still be this kind of gravitational pull towards politicians that clearly do not exude any Christ-like behavior. But the evangelical community is salivating to get them into office. And I'm sure you saw that a lot. But what is it? Is it just because they feel like their religious freedom is going to be protected by this person, even though they don't necessarily represent what they're supposed to in terms of being a follower of Jesus? Yeah. Um, to me, it has to do with pride and power. Mm. Um the idea that we are a part of a force that is on the right side and no one can destroy. Um, that's the whole idea of our country. We're the greatest country in the world. We've got the greatest military in the world. Yeah, bring it on. We'll take you down. Every level of power in our country seems it has that ability to be distorted and misused and abused. And unfortunately, when it comes to something that's on a pedestal and very, very noticeable, like a politician and a great speaker or this and that, a, a wonderful multi-site pastor, mega church pastor. Unfortunately, they're sitting on a landmine because they hold so much power. And when you are, I, we're a, I think it's funny that over the last year or so, especially through COVID, that um, I, I live in downtown LA where I, it's pretty diverse and it's, I would say it leans on the liberal side of politics and things like that. We don't talk much about politics down here. We just go about our business, but you see masks on people and people are taking care of people and they're worried about people. We lived in the suburbs for about the, a year and a half. And um, I can't tell you how many times I was yelled at for wearing a mask and called mm. a sheep, a sheep. And I, one time I stopped and said, Hey, are you a Christian? The guy goes, yeah. And I said, well, I am too. So like being called a sheep is like, totally cool to me. Like I am a Jesus follower. I'm a sheep of Jesus. Like, what are you calling me? Is this derogatory or what oh, is, man. it just shocks me the power, the control, the, the vitriol. And then you get a leader like we've had recently into politics and it just ignites uh, a group of people that want control and power and just are, you know, want to be the person over the next person and they're better than, and they're right. And everyone else is wrong. And all the language of take back what I've lived here for, I'm 50 years old. I'm going to be 51 next month. I don't know what I've lost in 50 years of being mm -hmm. here. What are we taking back? Yeah. Um, yeah. I've actually had to <laughs> let go of things because it's gone off the rails. So I, I don't know. I, I I think there's probably like people are have so many thoughts and differences and we're all unique. Uh, power just stands out to me because I've yeah. seen it abused across the board in every aspect of leadership, especially in the church manipulation. Um, that power thing to me is I, I don't know why you want to do this except to have power to have be power. in control. Yeah. Yeah. 
when you think about religion and what it was supposed to be, because I do think that it's now synonymous with with greed and power and unfortunately a lot of negative things. What do you feel that the main purpose of religion was supposed to be? Well, I mean, it, the Bible says it's pure and undefiled. It's to love God and love people. Like religion has, we've, we've commandeered things over time. Like I, I'll, all my 25 years of ministry have been in the evangelical circle. Mm-hmm. Well, now the evangelical circle really has a, a look about it, whether you agree with it or disagree with it. It looks like something, feels like something. It's been labeled now. Um, I can look back and go, oh, I really have been a part of the evangelical circle because I can see all the elements that we see on display in massive ways now, even in a little, a little bit in the past. Um, it's always been there. Um, my dad and mom, when I was a kid, we used to stand and uh, you know do the Pledge of Allegiance on Sundays at church. Um, <laughs> Wow. So it's been, nationalism has been around for a long time. It's like, what does this have to do with church? Right. Um, I'll say this, this last Sunday, I taught on being a church community and what that means. And that, that being a church community is way more about what we do than what we say, because we can say stuff all day long. And if there's no action to follow up our words, it's meaningless. I mean, mm-hmm. that's literally in scriptures that like, if you don't do what you say, you're clinging symbol and a noisy gong. Like if you don't act out love, why are you telling people you love people? Um, So I was, I like to tell people I was born a Christian because I was born into it. I was born in the Baptist family, you know? And so my dad was pastor and stuff. I remember when I was five, I accepted Jesus and got baptized. Okay. That's, that's great. I knew what I was doing. I understood what I was doing. I wanted to be a part of this community, but it wasn't until I was a junior in high school where I really feel like it took hold. And it took hold because I was a part of a youth ministry that was thriving because of the leader of this youth ministry. He believed in service, in being in our communities, in being outside the church, in um, caring for people in, in massive ways. So he started this program called Summer Ministries. At the end of summer, our church would go to this awesome summer camp called Hume Lake. It's up in Northern California. It's a great camp. Everybody loved it, but it was expensive to go to. So um, he created summer ministries. And if you went through the summer ministries program, you got to go to camp for free. The church paid you away. Hmm. And what the summer ministries program was, it was, it was a week from nine to noon in the morning. This was all during summer. So kids are, we're all open, all high schoolers. It was just high school. Uh, 90 noon in the morning, we spent a week where he went through and taught us and trained us and what it means to interact with people and what is, what is local missions? What is, what is, uh, you know, reaching out to people look like, what does leading someone to Christ look like? What does it mean to go across seas and care for another country or another people? Um, so he teaches all that. Then we had a week of back air Bible school and we'd split up. We had these little back air Bible schools all over town. Then we had a week of vacation Bible school where everything was on the church campus. It was all day long. It was fantastic. Then we had four weeks um, of day camp. Every week was a different event at the end of the week. So like week one, the last day we went to Disneyland. Week two, last day we went to the water slide park and the whole thing. If you went through that program, you went to camp for free. Well, he added something to that my junior year. He said, if you go through that program, we are also going to take four guys and four girls that went through that program on a missions trip. And we want you guys to literally, we're going to put you through what it means to be a missionary. So we actually sat before the missions board at our church and they interviewed us. And then they chose four guys and four girls to go on this missions trip. Then we had to raise a third of our money. Traditionally, we had to earn a third of our money. And then, you know, our parents and grandparents could give us the rest of it. But that junior year, year, we went to an island in the Bahamas, which sounds extravagant and lovely, but it was called Long Island. It's four miles long, six miles long and one mile wide. There are about 3,500 people living on the island, no running water, no electricity. The only generator on the island and pump for water was at the missionary's house in the middle of the island. So we went there for seven days and served uh, in flip-flops and shorts. And we were with kids and adults and it was all English speaking. So there wasn't uh, uh, anything there we had to worry about. Um, it was fantastic. We did work projects. We did church stuff with them. We shared our testimonies. We, And it just ignited this thing inside of me, not necessarily to be a missionary to a foreign country, but like this is not stuff I do during the week when I'm home. Like my, 
my neighbor needs care. I, I don't go walk the streets. Go, how are you guys doing? You need anything? I don't invite people to church. I don't go and sit down with kids at the park. Um, you know, today I wouldn't recommend doing that out of the blue. Get to know the parents first. But, <laughs> but and then the next year we did it again. We went to Belize and we were there for 10 years. And it just dramatically changed not just the religion or faith I had learned the first 17 years of my life, but now it dramatically changed what I in my religion and faith would be doing the rest of my life instead of learning. I told people on Sunday, I said, look, we could learn everything it means to be a Christian. Like our, our society today says, go learn stuff, go to school, uh, read, read a book, listen to a podcast, uh, you know, study that influencer, go learn stuff, learn stuff. Now, if you learn it, you know it. Okay, that's great. But Jesus says, you know how they'll know you mm-hmm. and you'll know me by your love for each other and others. And all of a sudden it's like this reverse thing that Jesus does all over the Bible. He goes, wait, I know you've heard it said, but let me tell you. So it's this reverse thing where he says, hey, they don't know me by going and sitting in a sermon. They don't know me by reading my Bible. You know how they know me? By you doing the things that's said in that Bible to them and for them. And that, that experience my junior high school year was radically life-changing. I tell people that's when God entered my life. I'd been learning about them all along, but that's when the spirit took hold and my life began to change. And I dedicated the next 25 years of my life to full-time ministry. But now everything that I've dedicated my life to is being squashed, abused, traumatized, ignored, um, sent out the door, picked out, yeah. So it's like, okay, uh, see ya. Yeah. I'm going to go keep doing it because I love Jesus, man. I love people. And there's a lot of hurt people. And you know what, what upsets me about that is because your exposure to that was helping others. And that's why you went into it. And that's what it should be. And you also said another thing. You're like, oh, I don't do this while I'm at home. And that's something that has actually always bothered me about the church and missions trips is why aren't you doing this at home? Why are we raising thousands of dollars to go to another country when you could go to the inner city, when you could go down the street in North Hollywood to help the homeless there? Have you had those conversations with people at your churches as to why missions trips are the the chosen path for service and ministry as opposed to doing local service? Yeah, so... The, the church circles I've been in, the last big church we were at had some great annual missions trips. Um, and I went on a few with them. I took, we went to Haiti two, two years. Um, the, I really loved those trips that we took because the guy that was kind of our core leader for it was sold out to caring for Haiti and still does. Whether mm. we keep coming back or not, he's going all the time mm. and he's caring for him. So that's his thing. He took us to experience that. And we were, ended up one year in this, the community of Morrency, which in the last uh, hurricane, like three years ago, was just devastated. They lost their whole village. Um, so it's incredible uh, to kind of experience that stuff. But what I'm seeing more and more is a shift from kind of the attitude of let's go care for people that are needy to, well, they're here too. Oh, so we don't have to go across these ribs, raise a bunch of money. Great. Let's do it here. And what happens here is I got my, you know, my, my story on Instagram. I got the picture with the little kid. I, I show people the, the stuff I was sorting. Oh, this is awesome. I feel so good that I help people. And then you might do it again. You might not, but you did it. So you're caring for people. Um, the church doesn't really practically care for people. I've seen very few churches truly lead the charge to care for a group of people and stick with it. Yeah, They do little projects. Well, we, we should be out in the community. I've had that conversation dozens and dozens of times. Hey, are we doing stuff for the community? Well, what could we do? Well, let's do a food drive. Okay. Oh yeah. They let's drop some, some clothes off of the, the school. Do they need it? I started asking questions. Why? Who's hungry? There's like 18 places you can get food. Let's go help them because they're doing it well. Um, I remember, and again, back to my youth pastor in high school, we used to go every year to Mexicali, uh, college here, Azusa Pacific University, coordinated big Mexico trips where thousands and thousands of high school kids from all the country would come for a week and you'd do projects all over that area of Mexico, just out of T- outside Tijuana. And 
I love that because we, we sat with the people and every year we went back to the same place. So we were with them every year. It was fantastic. I went for like eight years in a row. It's just amazing. Um, but one year we had a guy in church come up and say, cause we were building some houses. Every time we go down, we build a house. And he said, Hey, I, I own a lumber yard. Like I'll donate all the lumber all. And the youth pastor goes, no. And I was like, why do you say no? And I heard the conversation. He said, actually, we want to support their economy. So we're going to buy it locally there. And I was like, huh. it just shifted everything. What we do in the church right now is we do things that we think are sacrificial, but it ends up serving us as much as it serves them. Mm. And we don't pay attention to the long-term ongoing need to stay in proximity and frequency with each other that actually changes lives. Yes. And if you're doing that, guess where you're doing it? You're not doing it in the church. You're starting a nonprofit. You're going with another organization. Why in the world are all these nonprofits out there when we can do this right inside the church for <laughs> free? It's amazing. We got the money, we got the places, we got the people. Um, so it's not happening there. Again, yeah. it's not happening there. So I'm, Go, I can't be there anymore and, and sacrifice and and continue to get hurt and experience what I experience. Um, I, I got to leave it because I got to go start a nonprofit or I got to be part of another organization or I got to yeah. do it on my own now because it's yeah. not happening there. Well, now that you have backed away from full-time ministry, what is your hope for how the church will influence our society and our political culture moving forward? Uh, well, I got to be honest, I hope there's been a conversation and it's been enhanced during the COVID season of pastors resigning, staff people leaving their ranks, that kind of stuff. And so they bring it up, you know, kind of they wrap COVID around it a little bit, divisiveness and politics a little bit. Um, no, these people are on the same journey I'm on. They're, they're, they're confused. Hmm. They have grown up in a place that they have been told and they've been doing. And now all of a sudden, nothing looks like our Jesus anymore. And the leaders don't look like our Jesus anymore. And the politics and politicians don't look like our Jesus anymore. And it's become just a, you know what? It's just a part of life. You go to church and you take a stance. I am hopeful that more and more and more people do what I just did. And mm -hmm. not just the leaders, but the attenders too. Guys, go out there and find where it's happening and love Jesus and love people. You don't have to be in a 50-minute program on Sunday morning to learn about God. There are thousands of ways in our modern society for you to get connected to the understanding and knowledge of who God is and to study that, to dig deep. And why did Jesus always go away to pray? Because when he needed to study God and get close to God, he went to a place where he was by himself and, and, and he knew he could dig in. The rest of the time he was caring for everybody. So he did it all right. And I know he's Jesus. I understand that. But we can do that in meditation, in reading the scriptures on our own, in learning from people that we trust. It doesn't have to happen on a Sunday morning, 50 minutes. I told someone the other day, I'm exhausted of spending all the church's money and all the church's time producing a show for Sunday mornings. And nothing happens Monday through Saturday. I've recently been in a church that um, has, is paying $30,000 for $30,000 a month for a 13,000 square foot building. And, uh, there's not one thing we do in that property Monday through Saturday. And we had two morning services on Sunday. Is, is wow. that worth it? Is that wow. worth it? I, I just, I, that I hope more staff and leaders allow this kind of tension and, this discernment and this confusion to rise up in them and let God and the spirit lead them back to what the purity of our religion and faith is and get out and start doing, because you're going to realize real quick that what you've been doing for a long time, for, I, I know that in the next year of me being outside of full-time ministry, it will be more impactful because of the freedom I have to seek Jesus and seek others opposed you know, apart from an organization that has structured me or structured time, I know it will be more impactful this next year than the last 25 years of it. I know it will be because I'll be aligned with my beliefs and my, my, my concerns. And I just, I hope more leaders and attenders do exactly what I'm doing. And if you find 
that you are perfectly positioned in your church community to blow it up, to change it, to rise it up, to support it, because it's already good. There's good churches and good leaders out there. I'm not going to be disillusioned to that. Um, my position, I can no longer be a part of that organization, just partly because of the trauma I've experienced and and um, the, the PTSD I have from it. I have to be out. Yeah, uh, I have to yeah. be completely disconnected from all that environment. But there are others that can stay and help and care because the church is a good thing. And the meeting on Sunday morning is a good thing. And a location in a building is a good thing. How is it being used? Is it being used to teach and to say, or is it being used to do and to live and to love? Um, I'll support any church that's doing that stuff. Brent, I am very grateful for you taking your time to share your experience and your views. And this is a topic that is very, very important to me. And I hope more people continue to have these conversations. But I truly, truly wish you the best wherever God thank leads you. you next. So thank you so much for, for coming on the show. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Linda. Of course. And to the listeners, we will be back next week with Faith and Politics Part 3. <laughs>